So, hello to you all. My name is Jan Gunek. I'm the CEO and founder of Visionary Marketing, a digital agency dedicated to uh, digital transformation, digital training, and content. And today I'm going to talk to you about digital content per se, background, status, and trends. The things I want to focus on in this presentation are all about strategy and content strategy not the tactics and not the tools and not why you should use this latest great feature from Facebook or anything like that. We want to focus on the strategic aspect of web content, why you need to do it, is it new, is it not, what has changed and where will it go. That's me and that's my agency we do consulting and training, digital transformation, induction and training, content and performance, digital content and a bit of marketing and automation mostly for B2B customers. And my agency has just been founded in Paris and I'm part of the affiliation group. I'm also a writer and blogger and currently working on the English version of uh, our uh, bestseller in France called Mastering Digital Marketing Like a Boss, that's the working title in English and we're hoping to be able to release this ebook uh, because in English it will only be uh, produced digitally very shortly. The agenda for today, after a brief introduction, I will go into 10 plus 1 points regarding web content, uh, delivering my recommendations about how content is evolving and what you should do with it. And then I will end up with a conclusion and a, few, uh, and a bonus as well explaining how uh, internet content has evolved throughout the years. First and foremost, I would like to focus on the background and uh, where we're going to actually I have a confession to make which is uh, the confession of somebody who is probably writing too much and the problem for some of the creators sometimes I go into that problem as well is that we tend to be so buried in the content that we produce and so engrossed in what we do because we are creative people so we we go go for it and sometimes we forget to take a bit of hindsight look at things from a different perspective and wonder okay is what I'm doing really what I should be doing and why am I doing it content marketing on the web as far as I'm concerned is not new and sorry about the uh, screen grab here it's been taken from archive.org so the quality is not exactly um, um, up to scratch but this is a screen grab of one of the first websites that I uh, created in 1996 uh, for Unisys at the time in the UK and we were basically providing an internet parameter uh, for uh, internet banking in the UK and then it spread to throughout Europe and we have a French version and an English version and a German version as well. Uh, the idea was very clear and simple. Uh, the main problem uh, with us dealing with internet banking at the time is that we didn't know much about it so the trick was to look at what other banks, what all the banks had done uh, in the market, evaluate it and then realize that nobody had done much actually at the time and basically by evaluating others we turned ourselves into a position that basically we were also uh, positioning ourselves as experts so this is showing you and it worked beautifully actually maybe it's a week later I mean all the banks were calling us and we were able to engage with them just to show you that uh, this kind of techniques is not really new and in fact when I look at uh, how things evolve I can very much relate to uh, 
this is taken from our book, I mean the previous book that we wrote with Ove Cablo in Paris. Uh, there is there is a, a a portion of time during which technology is mature and most of the time you can't compress that. It's about 10-15 years on average. There are a few exceptions but they are few and far between. Sometimes you think that something is new like uh, the smartphone brought by Apple in 2007, except that it already existed in 2003, created by a company called QTech. Okay, fair enough. The operating system wasn't so sexy, but the tool was there. It just took about 10 years for it to mature. So, similarly, for web content, things happened. As soon as the web existed, people understood that they had this great ability to talk to the world and then write to the world. But at the time there were sort of two, two types of people confronting each other. There's those with negative assumptions, you know, well innovation is toxic and web content is useless, you know, why are we going to do this, you know, we can, we can send mailings to our clients, well why are we doing this? Why do we need this internet thing? And these positive assumptions uh, were people thinking that the internet could solve the world whereas in fact in, it couldn't in 1996 it just couldn't because it was too early stages and then there was this period uh, I would say roughly speaking about 10 years uh, where people digest the innovation and, and similarly with web content I was thinking about that time for companies to realize that content on the web was a bit more than just putting the co corporate brochure or you know that just putting text without links w wouldn't take you anywhere and now I think that we we're at, at a period where maturation has happened and it's not failed it's it's not completely disruptive it sort of blends with the real world and web content now is definitely part of everybody else's strategy be it's B2C and mostly B2B because obviously content marketing is used to attract customers through affiliate marketing or marketing automation and other such techniques. Now some people still today think that content marketing is new though but in fact what I showed you in 1996 is even very recent. But I'd like to go back in time and think about something which you've probably heard of. Uh, it's Michelin's tires of course but mostly the guide, the Michelin guide, which was invented in the turn of the 20th century. In 1908 actually they created the Bureau of Itineraries. It was a bunch of people behind phones uh, clients would call them and they would basically build the itinerary for uh, for them. So it's a bit like Google Maps before its time, really. Now, what Michelin is mostly famous for is not really just for building maps and itineraries for people, but mostly for building a great guide which is still published today and gives the list of the best well, you know, all the, you all know the Michelin stars throughout the world. They give, they grant stars to the base, the best chefs in the world, for because and and the reason why they did this is, you know, they were selling tires. They didn't need to do that. But the reason why they did this is they needed people to buy tires, and for them to buy tires, they needed to use their cars, and for them to use their cars, they needed to do something with it. And so they had this idea that, you know, if you wanted to take your car, then you could take it in the country and then go and visit a restaurant. And so they built this guide and, and it worked beautifully. But until the time that uh, uh, um, André Michelin, actually, is the, the owner, in 1920, uh, came to a restaurant and then he found that uh, one of his guys was used uh, just to prop a table uh, upright and then you thought there's something wrong there 
Now I've got to do something, and this guide is free, and then people are using it for other purposes, and they're not using it for that, and they shouldn't. And then he realized, and he uttered that phrase, which is often quoted, is, man only truly respects what he pays for. Now, as far as the internet is concerned, this is not quite true, actually. Content marketing very often is free. Well, very often but not always and sometimes good marketing content and good internet content well you have to pay for it otherwise you get only what you for your money's worth okay but if content marketing isn't new and even web content marketing isn't quite new then you're going to tell me fine but at least there is one thing which is new and it's social media and then I would say well as being actually one of the pioneers for social media in Europe and also part of social media business council for years on end in the US well not quite not quite social has been around for well quite a while now Facebook has just um, gone past 10 years LinkedIn 11 years and all those weren't even the first social networks to be created I mean, one of the first ones to be created was Friendster, which had almost already disappeared by 2004. And in 2007, Time magazine actually used this image, you know, it's a sort of mirror on the on the front page showing that person of the year was you, and that was very much understood by everybody on earth as being really the revolution I think it is a revolution social is a revolution but and I want to show you here a copy of the French Express in 2000 says but nine years well sorry uh, eight years before the, Ex the French Express was using exactly the same gimmick on its year 2000 cover doesn't mean that Time Magazine copied the French Express, it probably doesn't even know it exists, but what it means is, even in 2000, even though the state of the web wasn't what it, what it is today, and that the tools we have at the moment uh, weren't there, suddenly the genes of the internet already included sharing and the sharing of content, of course, and the, the web has always been based on content. It's always been based on not just content but links as we're going to see in a few moments. So it's new and at the same time it's not. What is new is that the tools are performing a lot better, they're a lot more powerful, that we can now link to well quite a few many people. My Twitter account now is almost 10,000 big which is by by US standards not very big but by European standards very big so it's a lot of people 10,000 people is a lot of people and I can tell you by the judging by the interactions I get it's not just 10,000 people like this you know just added by chance or randomly it's also people who have actually chosen me for the content that I produce uh, regularly on the internet for the past uh, 15 or 18 years actually okay so if that is new then obviously marketing in a new way what we could call neo marketing that is new well not quite not quite either Mar uh, neo marketing and actually the importance of looking after your customer and thinking about your customers first is probably as old as marketing itself but it's certainly a founding document which everybody in, interested in web matters should read or reread it's the clue train manifesto cluetrain.com uh, symbolized by this armadillo on the left um, basically what uh, the clue train people were trying to get out here is with this armadillo thing is there are trends which are here to stay, you can't avoid them. And one of some of the things that 
very important in this in this clue train manifesto beyond the first uh, uh, the, the first dance which goes um, uh, markets are conversations which everybody knows but there are 94 others and some which are very important which tell you that you have to use a human voice when you write on the web actually I think you can cross right on the web and I don't think that the clue train manifesto is anything like internet marketing it's marketing full stop um, but actually content strategies have been at the center of internet content from day one I remember Seth Godin's idea virus probably not his most remembered opus but probably one of the best I know I literally the idea virus was actually published on the internet in maybe 1999 in a very weird way Godin actually circulated his paper in PDF format throughout the world anybody was able to copy it and leave it on his website for it to be downloaded and, and if you go to my website visionarymarketing.com you're actually going to find it so you can download it for free because it's always been there it was circulated for free but then what Godin did was is he then proceeded to sell it on Amazon in 2001 if I'm not mistaken and it became number one top sale on Amazon for years on end what he showed was something that was very counterintuitive you have to give away and then you can start selling this is something which is really central to content marketing on the web but very poorly understood but many companies which still want to push their old products without wonder, wondering you know what people are interested in or even caring about people that is wrong and this is this is the wrong approach this is very short term you may think that you're going to do a good deal by selling stuff quickly but it doesn't work that way pinko marketing proceeded similarly by saying don't use military analogies like targeting customers or doing a campaign I really like that idea of respecting customers I think this is very very central and Tap Scott in more recently uh, went on with Weekonomics showing how uh, crowd sourcing can actually help build stuff which this is stuff which has shaped the internet and shaped internet content and I've done so many engagements in the field with other bloggers and I still do uh, for companies or clients or even for fun sharing content building content together that is really at the center of the internet and I I'm still surprised that it is sometimes so poorly used um, that people are still trying to throw information at people regardless of how interested in interested they are May great many of these notions neo marketing were actually described not in an American book by Seth Godin but by a European book by Bado and Cova, Franco Italian researcher. And neo marketing was really a founding book which uh which actually led to uh the one I wrote called Visionary Marketing, which eventually became a company. Okay, but Community management, now you're going to tell me that is new. And uh, once again, I'm going to disappoint you and take you back to 1997, Netgain, Hegel and Armstrong, in which they defined what they call the Gardner's Touch, the main principles for building communities. And you're going to see that these principles for building communities they're very much at the center of how you build content and why you do it and how you should do it. If you understand this, most of the other stuff is going to fall in place very easily. For starters, communities, most companies think that they, ha they have communities that they, they even sometimes they think they own the community. Well, they, they should think twice because you don't own a community 
a community is is something which which works by itself, which lives by itself. And most of most clients actually do not have a community. You have to build this community, facilitate it. You don't manage it suddenly. I hear this term community management so often. But in fact it's devoid of content and meaning because you don't manage a community. You don't say, hey guys, I'm going to manage you. No, you don't. They're not your employees. They are people who share passion and a common interest. Now you get me. Content and the purpose of content is this. You have to fuel passion and a common interest. If you don't understand this, you don't even understand why you're building content on the internet and helping each other. But that's the stuff that we see very much in mostly in B2B when we start talking about subjects. They may be very niche subjects but subjects that we're all interested in and then we start arguing with each other and building together responses and, 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 and understanding together. And there must be a mutual benefit. This is also one of the reasons why most companies do not have a a community because they fail to remunerate their clients with something. It doesn't have to be money, right? <laughs> Most of the time it must not be money, but it has to be something uh, more uh, tangible in terms of uh, emotion that the client can feel or the, the community member can feel so that he can feel part of the brand or the spirit of the of the uh, overall culture um, generated by the brand if there is one. So you don't manage communities. So community managers behold. You don't manage communities. You facilitate communities. And this is done through three major uh, steps which are de described by Hegel and Armstrong in the book I I've just talked about. Ned Gain. And it's called the gone as such. Seeding, feeding, weeding. Very simple. But it very, very often overlooked by companies as well. We say, oh, we want to build a community, but we need to seed first. What does that mean? That means that, let's say, Wikipedia. Wikipedia, when they started, they didn't start from scratch. That's what everybody thinks. Yeah, they just put a wiki online and people started to contribute. Well, my foot. They didn't do that. Of course not. It doesn't happen that way. What Wikipedia did, in fact they weren't called Wikipedia in the beginning, they were called Newpedia. And then Newpedia was a failing business so they they actually went under. And then one day Larry Sanger suggested to um, Jimmy Wales that they should contact this guy Ward Cunningham who developed this technology called a wiki and then put the content online and see whether people would actually finish the work that they'd started and then they put all this stuff online and they had tens of thousands of pages online and then I remember by 2004 and still today you could type any keyword Wikipedia would come on top. So then, obviously, the mutual benefit for somebody contributing to Wikipedia, however hard and however unwieldy the uh, interface, Jimmy Wells even admitted that in uh, a conference in Amsterdam not so long ago, I related on my blog, visionarymarketing.com. Uh, even though the interface is very unwieldy, um, users started to contribute because the benefit was too strong. Then you start feeding, that's when people uh, contribute, and then weeding. That's typically what Wikipedia is doing with their three R, uh, three reviews uh, policies, and then many policies for reviewing content when a page is too uh, debated and there's uh, too much of uh, you know people battling over the content and 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 correcting it. You have to have three people at least uh, agreeing with it or otherwise oh, sorry if you have more than three times 
uh, people actually erasing and then re-entering and then re-erasing then in, in actually this this part gets frozen and there's all sorts of rules that they bring in so that now they are actually slowing down the pace of of uh, updating Wikipedia right social media I've talked about it so now the next thing that you have to bear in mind once you've understood all this is that now you understand what a community is. You understand that you understand where where content marketing comes from and and why you do it, and how you can use it as part of a content strategy. But 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 this is not all. I mean, one thing that most companies forget to think about is before you jump on the web content bandwagon, just hey people, think a while. Who are you? What is your brand? What are your characteristics? And it's funny that when you talk to clients, I mean, most of the time they either think that they are a sensitive brand or a preferred brand. So they either think that people actually want to get at them and criticize them, most of the time they don't, or that they want to go on the web to say that they love them. But in fact, most of the time, most companies are under the radar and mostly. B2B companies, small companies, you are under the radar guys so you have to get known before everybody, anybody feels something about you and you have to do something different, you have to stand out from the crowd it's actually one of the areas where it's easiest to use social media and web content because and B2B is because you're under the radar. You have, you run no risk. There are there, there are very very few risks that somebody's going to bat Matthew on the internet on Facebook. Actually, people don't use Facebook very much for B two B, so you don't even need to worry. So there's nothing to fear, but innovation that must be embraced. And then another big portion of companies, I mean, like uh, banks, insurance companies, or uh, telecoms, telecom operators, and I manage social media for a telco for six years. So I know a bit about this. Uh, mostly when going from B to B to B to C, then I found out that you know obviously the functional brand is either it works or if, or fix it. And then the the greatest focus for a brand which is functional, you know, is is in this case is community management. But but community management in that sense that you know as a, as in forum or or customer support social CRM that's where it happens. And then I see brands which are fitting into that category and then start doing you know lolcats and whatnots on what whatnots on Facebook. But this is completely irrelevant. You have to address your customers first, fix customer service first, and then move on to something else. Now, strangely enough, preferred brands are very few and far between. And sometimes I found, and I found this with Ferrero one day when talking with my my peer at, at Ferrero, who was the guy in charge of Nutella, uh, that actually in this particular case, communities are built by themselves. Whether it's sensitive or preferred, then communities tend to thrive by by themselves. All you have to do is to nurture the community. They, they sometimes they are more than one actually, but also what I realized is that preferred brands were sometimes scared that they would go from one category to the other, and it sometimes happens. And actually, if you go um, on YouTube, uh, there's going to be a, a French video you're going to we want you want to find on Nutella. It's it's been viewed by millions of people. And it shows how palm oil is actually the major ingredient with sugar in Nutella. And this is this is one of the things that they're really, really afraid of. And in fact, people, if you're not in preferred or sensitive brand, rejoice because it means that you can actually you have a lot more leeway. So now you understand a little bit more better, a little bit better how to position your content how to use it, why you want to use it, why you want to use content on the internet and, and and how you should articulate the content to make it uh to make it uh positive and successful. 
Now I want to spend a little bit more time on um, 10 points which I found on the internet on web content and number one somebody told me one day that is dead is dead so you know uh, the web is dead no it's not the web is not dead obviously this is a an evolving discipline and then obviously websites and CMS's and there's so many of them keep changing and keep evolving <coughs> but there are still websites and I can tell you for having managed a <coughs> sorry a w a quite a few websites corporate websites and others and e-business for years on end and even though some people are trying to replace them with blogs it is not always a good idea because it's not always WordPress is a great tool for blogs uh, you can do pretty good pretty decent website with it but good websites are not done with WordPress they're not and good content on websites reacts very differently from good content on blogs good content on blogs tends to get indexed in search engines well in the search engine now because there's only one left very fast it's very dynamic it goes very quickly but it also goes in a flash and it's very hard to find articles back in a blog the the way that the search engines tend to forget about them very quickly and they replace them and they're very dynamic and they use the RSS feeds and this is mostly the RSS feed which brings readers but on the site you can build a much better long-term SEO strategy than you would on on WordPress so don't don't get mistaken there's still there's still a future for for CMS's and uh, so very recently I was doing some very good work on on easy publish but they you know the three major CMS's in the market so the Joomla and Drupal and and, and easy publish well the, the open source ones of course so I think it's uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same, as Arthur Scar was saying. Yes, of course, it's changing, it's evolving, and mostly uh, mobiles are changing the game, and social is changing the game. But it doesn't mean that you don't have uh, two uh, different technologies. And basically, I've seen a witness in the field that it was best to keep blogs WordPress for best of breed as blogs and and uh, your a, a proper CMS uh, for for web uh, another thing I've heard very often actually it sort of comes back every year or so is blogs uh, blogs are dead blogs are dead but but in fact they're not uh, they're not it's it, it, it doesn't matter a blog is a tool it's a way of disseminating content that's all it's it's a tool it's a means to an end so obviously maybe for people who thought that blogs were an end in itself uh yeah in that particular case yes they might be dead sure we don't we don't care oh yeah sir we want a blog we're going to be cool no you you're not going to be cool you just can keep up with the genesis because everybody's got a blog now so what has changed though is the way that you do blogs and mostly in the enterprise context and I've done that many years we tend to do collaborative blogs because it's easier so the the solo blogger myth is not quite a myth I mean there are a few a few of those actually I'm probably one of those been been blogging for 10 years and, and it's it's rare and, and it obviously it makes me an influencer but I mean people like me you know able to blog day in day out and then do work for clients is rare so it's it's a, it's a bit of a myth and it's a bit of a myth for an enterprise to think that you're going to be able to do this on your own and with just one person in charge so also if you're doing this solo then you have a, a different perspective and you have to weave partnerships Okay, and there, there, there's a few more uh, hints about blogs, but certainly 
just just uh, remember that blogs aren't dead they're just a means to an end and if you have to go through these things properly you know do analytics properly you should have to do SEO as well is not there but and uh, I've also heard that comments are dead but I, I once put a piece together on on the web like this saying you know, okay blogs are not dead but comments are and then I got 45 comments so it shows that basically you know uh, it doesn't really happen that way third one thing that strikes me 18 years on is that I think that the web is still very 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 badly understood and that's the world over I'm not saying just in Europe I see wherever I go but I look at a website and what do I see bunch of text no links but that's a complete misunderstanding of what the web is all about actually when you type a URL in your location bar most of the time users start typing HTTP colon slash slash they don't even know why they do this actually because they don't know what HTTP is but HTTP refers to hypertext transfer protocol the hypertext being the fact that you using links to bounce from one piece of content to another and that's fundamental if you don't understand this you don't understand how the web is working you don't understand this notion of links and sharing and bouncing back from one piece to another and obviously the whole thing works around this hinges on that so your content should be using links and I very often hear oh no no we don't put links because we do not want pe people to go outside on another website but people you have to do that if you don't do that and people won't come to you either so you have to be able to give before you can get and I still see in the field that there is still a misunderstanding between people as well but basically the people building people like me building content on the internet okay granted we may be a bit of geeks slightly because we know how to use those tools but okay fair enough but almost everybody else is a geek aren't they everybody's got a computer everybody's got a smartphone I mean close to one and a half billion smartphones were sold in 2013 it's huge everybody has a smartphone at least in the developed world and and the developing world will soon have with new Chinese handsets being delivered there with low-cost um, operating systems but so the the geekiness of the person producing the content doesn't really matter what matters is that you understand and also as a web content producer that you understand yourself that you are a business person so web content first and foremost is about business is about doing business and about addressing your customers and the fourth point I'd like to make is about user generated content and user generated content has also always been at the heart of web content from day one that's a bit what I was saying about the Time magazine cover a few moments ago user generated content is important because this is how you collaborate and this is how you get people and it could be customers but it could be partners get to build together and the web is about building together and we see how you know the amazing results that we get with crowdfunding nowadays show the power of the people uh, you know putting themselves together and doing things together and that is true of content as well but UGC isn't as pervasive as you might think and I'm here I'm reproducing Forrester's social technographics group with their kind permission because uh, we used it in a book and they gave us this permission to use it 
and it's it's an it's a very old uh, categorization of uh, users in the U.S. Uh, where content creators were actually uh, assumed to be 19% uh, in the U.S. where you can count people more than once in all these categories so this is why it, it adds up to more than 100% but creators is uh, the, the the highest uh, kind of uh, uh, content producer where uh, most uh, most involved in terms of publishing blogs or web pages and stuff like that and it, it evolved throughout the years now it's in 2010 so that's the latest I got from uh, latest numbers I got from Forrester I don't quite know whether it's evolved at all uh, it's, it's gone up and we can see a, a huge discrepancy here between the US and, and Europe and this is a European average and we're going to see in a few moments there's there's even more discrepancies amongst Europeans uh, in terms of uh, the social technographics groups uh, now I would challenge us slightly what uh, these numbers show in fact uh, in, in these these category creators we added uh, uh, added vi video and photos and and obviously uh, Facebook has changed the game because almost everybody else has been uh, have become a content creator uh, even though a lot of people are very passive on Facebook I mean the majority of people are, face are, are passive on Facebook so, so that, that, that hasn't changed very much uh, creators and content creators and UGC is the fact of a minority and uh, if we look at different cultures that we're going to see that these minorities vary from country to country like um, say these creators is say 14% on average in Europe but they are only 12% in France but if you look at the UK it's slightly better 15% but in the in Germany it's even worse 9% where social media is not quite liked for well obvious privacy reasons where in most German speaking countries privacy issues are taken very seriously um, and is that right so obviously there are very 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 strong cultural differences between all these countries and areas and UGC is important but not everybody can do it so you have to understand this digital photography I would say there's two main categories well, there's three actually. There's one is the, you know, horses for courses, mobile sharing, taken on Instagram and Pinterest, and which favors image C versus quality and makes actually any amateur photographer cringe. But but it's fun, and it, it's great with events. You 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 can use this during events. It's really it's really brilliant. There's there's this category with which goes to online sharing. Like, uh, so it's sort of an ongoing battle between Flickr and Picasso. Uh, Picasso's sort of been swallowed by Google Plus, and then Flickr was more was stronger for for a while. This goes more with amateur photographers. So the the top end of the market is going uh, market. Uh, the top end of say users is going to online sharing on these kind of platforms. And and for a while, Flickr was more reserved for top-end users, and then Picasso was more for low-end users. And now this is changing actually, with Google Plus communities tend to be rather strong and buoyant, and Flickr is sort of uh, flickering, <laughs> no pun intended. And then there's photo blogs, and uh, you can actually have a look at mine on where where people exchange. Uh, uh, exchange likes and 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 views on photos and it's great it's a great place actually that's that's probably what I like best is how much I uh, I get how many likes I get on on my blog when I post a photo uh, but photo is uh, is usable with UGC we've seen a few moments with video it's a lot more difficult but as you as long as you understand these different categories then you can play around with photos properly and uh, obviously it's a must-have there's no good content without a photo but now for companies enterprises you have to be very careful uh, with 
uh, legal matters and copyrights on photos. So you have to be careful. My my uh, my advice here is either you buy um, rights-free photos so that you can use them as long as you wish. Because if you put a photo on your blog and then you know your rights expire after a year or two, then it's going to be a a mind-boggling problem. So you can go to websites like Photolio and others, which tend to actually cause a problem to photographers because they they lower prices quite a lot. A Photolio is really good, and um, regardless, from from a user perspective, there's another great uh, French startup actually, Photolio. Uh, Number six is video. So video is very, very different from um, uh, from uh, photos, uh, photography, because uh, photography you can use with UGC. Video you can hardly do that. It's not new. I've been doing this for 19, since 1999, so it's been going on for a while. And then people tell me, yeah, but in 1999 it wasn't very good. And then I tell them, well, not really. It was pretty good. Uh, because we had different technologies, and the technology was was actually uh, it was real audio, real video at the time it was quite good, and they could adapt the bandwidth to uh, well, they could adapt to the bandwidth so that they would present the best kind of video. And actually, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. It was a lot more optimized than it is now. When you have say one gig videos on YouTube, that is nonsensical. So there has been a web TV boom in 2008, and that's for sure that YouTube's responsible for this. And the connected TV, as long as people understand and how to make it work, not always great in Europe. Even though Netflix now is coming to Europe, and well, it's come to the UK, and it's all working well there after two years, uh, and it's now coming to France, and I'm really uh, looking forward to it. Um, so that bring a bit of disruption of that market and see how it works. But also, um, you know, video is, is very inspirational for many customers, very enterprise, many enterprise customers who think that they can reproduce what Lady Gaga is doing or Trip and Tyler, or some, some, some of these um, guys on the internet. But the problem is, it's a lot more difficult than you know, taken at face value. Face value is easy, quick, cheap, and lively. But the reality is not easy for all, and uh, it's not cheap either. Uh, a price for a video could go anything from seven euros per video, if you do it yourself, to a hundred thousand euros. So it depends on whether you use actors, whether what kind of quality you want. You know, do you want professional photo uh, well video? photographers or what do you want to do it yourself actually I tend to favor the do-it-yourself uh, manner uh, or the cheap manner because I think that it works best on the internet now also one of the things I find is that podcasts are hard to find uh, mostly after uh, iTunes changes and the fact that they've dissociated podcasts from iTunes and it's wow it's mind-boggling uh, even I, I'm, I'm a fan of podcasts, and I keep podcasting things, and even I have problems. I can imagine what the average user is thinking. And UGC and video just doesn't work. It's not just me, actually, having tried it at Orange and failed, <laughs> lamentably. Oh, we had one. We had one guy, actually, was able to do it. He did it very well, by the way, so he won the prize. Uh, even Shark Week and... Uh, uh, National Geographic uh, tried that, and and they 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 failed, and uh, they said uh, when they testified at Blockwell when I last met them, um, you know we tried it and with video it wasn't working, and we tried it with photographs and it worked. So it's not it's not always easy, and also what I see very much is companies, uh, well thinking that they're going to make you know noise on the internet with videos, and then they end up having a hundred views and it's pathetic it's quite difficult quite difficult and it takes a lot of uh, thinking and uh, positioning and sharing and something which is very often lacking in enterprises the lack of 
of of sharing of content and how and, and the knowledge of how to share it properly. Sunbites, same thing. They tend to be quick and easy and good, good and podcast friendly, but but they they're quick if no editing is required. I had a I interviewed somebody, uh, an analyst, uh, uh, a month ago, and uh, I had to edit his. Uh, his podcast and uh, out of uh, 30 minutes of interview I was only able to end up with 16 minutes of content. The guy actually he was so much stuttering and repeating himself and and oh god it was a bloody nightmare. So it's quick if no editing is involved and the podcast same difference very hard to find now you have to create your iTunes channel, it works, you can use Blurberry on WordPress for instance works fine but then it's, it's a hell of a it's a hell of a job to find it on on the iTunes and uh, it's easy unless you use a bad telephone line so then I would recommend you use uh, a conference service like well, freeconferencecall.com if you don't want to pay for it or, or otherwise you can use Premiere or any other um, professional uh, conference call service and then record the conversation from within the conference call it's a lot better than using a, a microphone and then there's there's questions about visits and how much it attracts people that's another issue it's very hard to attract people with uh, podcasts web radio something I've seen and used and done for many years it's very engaging it's very good if it's done professionally. It brings variety and it's postcard friendly. Same difference. Uh, so it's a it's a sort of a step up from uh, podcasts and sound bites. It's done more professionally. It can be expensive though uh, if you do it with a company, uh, but you will be able to find some boutique agencies doing this quite well. Uh, tends to be hard for non-professionals as well. We tried to internalize it at uh, at Orange, and it failed because it was too hard, too much pressure on the on the teams. And the challenges for uh, UGC are also great because uh, it's difficult to uh, get on with it and get people to understand, and record themselves. There are also some solutions uh, which enable people to record themselves on the radio, but tend to be pretty hard to to use but you end up using well service somebody else's service to uh, manage the uh, engagement events and social media are one of the obvious sources of uh, content and uh, here I'm pictured with some of my friends actually blogging at an event it's um, it looks like we're doing our email but we're not we're actually live blogging which is one of our passions so we stand with our laptops and now actually my tablets on the on our laps and, and and typing away what people are saying is a great way to engage with people in events I do it very very often I do it for business now as well and uh, producing content on the spot and it's a lot better than just tweeting the event of course tweeting is important but it's just the sounding board you need, you need some content to put in there and, th and that's really where you you produce it and, uh, and events are really great. Uh, there, there's s some of our techniques for um, actually doing well on events and uh, that's really what I, 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 I recommend. Uh, B2B as I explained earlier uh, if you're in B2B rejoice web content is for you it's even better than that you will be able to use web content to uh, uh, to produce leads for your business, and uh, and and this is very enthusiastic. I think for for even for small businesses to be able to uh, uh, pick up uh, users online uh, from the website and uh, and and you and have leads from the internet website. Now the bonus for uh, this is going to be my my conclusion. Uh, as I said earlier on there was this digestion phase I think we're in a, a period now where we're reaching maturity but mastering content properly like a boss I should say is difficult and not all companies actually can manage that properly some are newbies and are just entering late in that game 
and they just most of the time try and keep up with the Joneses and not really good, not producing good content because all they're trying to do is just to mimic what others are doing. There's the zombies. The zombies are those who actually do produce content. Sometimes there's been a good content producer who's actually shown the way and then he's gone and then somebody else has replaced him and they don't they 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 move with the movement. They they feed the blog. They don't quite remember why though. And this and most most of the time they fail to ask themselves the questions of why am I doing this and has it changed in the past two years? Now do I need to change the way I do things now? Do I get better results? Do I get worse results than I used to two years two years ago? How should I do? And there's the experts. And experts are few and far between unfortunately. But even though it's progressing. So I think the the, the real issue is there. You have to uh uh, focus on the right questions, the why, the what, and the how, and mostly the why. Very often it starts with how. What content type? How should I do this? Should I do text, video, interviews? I've given you hints about that so that it would remain concrete. But the main issue is in how you produce things. Is why do I produce this? Even before you start wondering, you know, what kind of content you want to produce. But most of the time, because this this web content initiatives have started some years ago then you end up with content that's already been produced but then you have to put your digital content know-how back in the game so that you really wonder and challenge what you're actually doing and why you're doing it so my conclusion is uh, going to be these five takeaways and I'm done with my hour of presentation uh, the scene changes constantly and that is not new in the internet world so you have to adapt constantly to new ways of doing things and new techniques and new platforms and new and new ways of sharing etc but sure content marketing is important but you have to remember why you're doing it and you have to focus on what kind of company you are and think about your culture not just content but you have to try and differentiate remember that producing content doing marketing is not about just doing things it's about doing things differently and last but not least you have to admit that you're going to work by uh, through trial and errors you're going to try certain things and some are going to work and some aren't and uh, and this is me and uh, thank you very much for listening I hope you found this presentation interesting and inspiring that is is going to give you uh, ideas and incentives for building more and better content on the internet and should you want uh, any hints or anything else you can try and contact me through these uh, contact details. Thank you very much and uh, maybe see you in another class. Goodbye.